so uh, the ang2 uh, and ang1 are actually two important proteins which are um, uh, released by activated endothelial cells whereas ang1 is a protective uh, protein ang2 uh, is a protein which increases in cases of inflammation and it, it further increases the endothelial vascular permeabilities so it has observed that in adult polytrauma patients higher ang2 level was associated with more severe injury and increased chance of subsequent development of ali or ards and increased mortality similarly another important molecule uh, called srag the soluble receptor for advanced glycation end products it's a member of the immunoglobulin family and it's expressed and secreted uh, from the type 1 alveolar epithelium the predominant alveolar epithelium and uh, it increases early in response to trauma and it was observed in studies that elevated srag values at admission correlates well with uh, the amount of lung damage in terms of the volume of lung contusion subsequently uh, observed in uh, chest imaging as well as subsequent development of ali and ards clara cell protein 16 is another one Uh, the clara cells are a type of cells uh, which are found in the alveolar epithelium it's less common uh, cell in as far as its population is concerned in the, in the alveolar lining but it secretes a very important protein cc16 the clara cell protein 16 and it it has got protective role it protects lung tissues from inflammation oxidative stress fibrosis and ards so it is found that in plasma and bowel fluid increased level of cc16 uh predicts subsequent development of AD, ali and ards and it also correlates uh, like the srag protein with the uh, amount of uh, lung contusion <coughs> extracellular histone is another uh, protein which uh, uh, is secreted by endothelial cells and also it correlates with increased incidence of ali ards in polytrauma uh, setting now coming to another uh, group uh, which is a, a very important inflammatory biomarkers and il6 we all know about uh, since the onset of covid so uh, it was uh, uh, observed in different studies whether il6 increased level of il6 can contribute to uh, was outcome in uh, polytrauma patients and uh, recent meta analysis have uh, included 11 studies including 775 participants and they observed that il6 level if it is increased within 24 hours of trauma then it significantly predicts subsequent mortality and multi organ dysfunction syndrome in patients with polytrauma associated ards so uh, one aspect is to find uh, uh, the level of a certain marker for example here il6 and uh, to identify the patients who are likely to deteriorate further the another important um, utilization uh, utilization of these biomarkers can be whether we can uh, uh, utilize them in uh, therapeutic decision making or surgical decision making this is a very important study which came more than 10 years back uh, in trauma in polytrauma setting after the initial uh, damage control uh, resuscitation and surgeries usually the secondary definitive surgeries are done few days later once the patient a bit stabilizes but most often we see that uh, this patient deteriorates develops new onset infections or multi organ dysfunctions after uh, the secondary surgery so whether uh, based on initial uh, biomarker profile can we uh, decide uh, when to do the secondary surgery to prevent further deterioration this research questions were studied in this uh, prospective cohort study where they uh, did biomarker analysis of il6 and tnf alpha on admission and subsequently also in all patients and uh, the two cohorts were followed one which uh, underwent early secondary surgeries within day 4 whereas another cohort which underwent late secondary surgeries after day 4 between day 5 and 8 and perioperative biomarker profile in these patients uh, reveals that the group which uh, underwent late secondary surgery uh, after day 4 did not have any uh, fluctuations in the il6 levels in the period period whereas the early surgery group had intraop and immediate post op elevation in the il6 levels which translated into a significantly high incidence of uh, organ dysfunction in early secondary surgery group compared to late secondary surgery group and uh, when they did the regression analysis they found that 
patients who had initial IL-6 values more than 500 and early secondary surgery, the chance of development of subsequent multiple organ failure was very high. The correlation coefficient was 0.96. Whereas this chance was less when IL-6 initial 500 picogram value in combination with late surgical uh, cohort was analyzed. The correlation was modest. So uh, this piece of information uh, we can utilize in your clinical decision making by postponing those group of patients who has initial IL-6 IL values uh, very high, more than 500 picogram per deciliter. Another similar uh, study which utilized uh, the neutrophil and monocyl L-selectin uh, label. These are the uh, uh, molecules which expressed by the neutrophils and monocytes in response to uh, sepsis. And they, the, their expression suggests that the patient is either already in sepsis or going to develop sepsis or MODS. So in this uh, study, which came just few months back, here also in a similar fashion, the major non-life-saving surgeries, the definitive surgeries like pelvic fixation, long bone fracture, all these surgeries were done. And this L-selectin values were uh, observed whether they can uh, predict subsequent development of any complication following secondary surgeries. And they observed that, that this monocyte L-selectin and neutrophil L-selectin uh, has um, odds ratio of above one and significantly predicts the subsequent development of sepsis and MODS. The other important predictors were injury severity scores. The higher severity of injury may have more sepsis and the time since injury, like in the previous study we already observed. An important point to note that this L-selectin fare, uh, fared well compared to the C-reactive protein uh, in this setup. So uh, to summarize, uh, there are even more uh, biomarkers which can be utilized like uh, endothelial, different endothelial injury markers like heparin sulfate, syndactin ones and all. But due to lack of uh, major um, uh, data in the trauma background, I omitted them. So to summarize, uh, um, uh, as far as the pure trauma setup is concerned, neural proteins have important roles like uh, uh, S100 beta, GFAP and UCHL1. Uh, in the setting of polytrauma associated ARDS, you can utilize various al alveolar or endothelial injury uh, markers and various inflammatory markers. One is to um, utilize the negative predictive value to do away with uh, cost, uh, costly investigations and to readily identify the patients who can be observed and discharged early or to uh, uh, make them undergo any other differential diagnosis which you have any mind. Secondly, in case of uh, polytrauma, the different inflammatory markers can be utilized for uh, therapeutic decision making like timing of surgery and subsequent prediction of development of subsequent organ dysfunction overall prognosis. However, there are a lot of scope of further research in this area. So we must at the same time identify what are the major limitations and where further research should be uh, focused into. So the first of all, uh, whenever we test new, uh, new investigation model, it is always compare with the gold standard. Here, uh, as far as the biomarkers in trauma are concerned, we do not have even any gold standard biomarker. So we do not know with which we should compare to begin with. Secondly, for each biomarker, ideal biological samples are to be identified. For example, for a lung injury biomarker, whether the blood biomarker level is enough, or we should always do a ball sampling uh, that needs to be uh, decided in subsequent research. Third thing is that the kinetics of the biomarker, a particular biomarker when it rises, when it reaches the peak and when it comes to trap, all this uh, has to be decided. Otherwise, the timing of sampling uh, will influence the results. Next, uh, we must uh, decide whether a panel of biomarker will be more suitable versus a single biomarker in any given, given clinical scenario. For example, in TBI, uh, UCH L1 uh, and GFAP have been utilized in a panel versus the other uh, single biomarkers and found to be better useful. And lastly, the combination of biomarkers with the different clinical uh, markers can be uh, further utilized in the form of a scoring system to predict any uh, different outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dalim Badia, for such a wonderful uh, 
presentation for various biomarkers and their interpretation for various clinical outcomes in patients who present with trauma. We will take up uh, the discussion at the end after all the four sessions. So I request you to stay and uh, I think there will be a lot of queries. So we'll discuss uh, uh, at the end. So we'll proceed with the next session, which is uh, another very important uh, session because when we see the critically ill patients uh, uh, from various aspects, from the clinical management, from the prognostication, the judicious use of resources, because the critical care setup usually has a limitation. Uh, we cannot take all the patients uh, at various phases. So for various purposes, uh, we require the use of uh, various modalities, including biomarkers. And for this, uh, I know uh, Dr. Shrikant Srinivasan is the best person to comment upon this important topic for various biomarkers in the uh, management of critically ill septic patient. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan is a uh, consultant and head critical care medicine at Manipal Hospital, New Delhi. He has a vast uh, experience in critical ill and he has a great contribution in various uh, critical care platform. He, has, uh, he is conducting uh, various workshops, written books on point of care ultrasound, extra corporeal life support and advanced mechanical ventilation. He is also the associate editor of uh, Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. He has also written books on critical care medicine, including textbook of point of care ultrasound. And he is working a great in teaching training uh, uh, in various programs of uh, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. And he's also a co-founding member of uh, the Guru Gram branch. I think he's uh, one of the best uh, critical care specialists I know. Uh, over to you, Shrikant for biomarkers for outcome in critically ill septic patient. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rakesh, for that kind introduction. And I thank the Indian College of Anesthesiologists for inviting me to talk about uh, this topic. And I'll just uh, continue with the ball which has been started to roll by Dr. Dalim. I'll talk about the aspects of biomarkers, uh, especially with regards to critically ill septic patients. Now, we know as per the current definition, of sepsis, it's a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Mm -hmm. So that is the definition of sepsis, which, which is currently accepted all over. It's basically a dysregulated host response, right? And we know that it is, it is a real and threatening problem. 30 million cases which occur every year. One out of 17 patients who are get admitted in the hospital has sepsis. And one out of four ICU patient gets sepsis, one out of two unfortunately succumbs to the sepsis, septic cascade. And it's been estimated in every three to four seconds, somebody dies from sepsis, right? So the problem is very real. This is a very landmark kind of a, a article which was there by Kumar et al, which said that early antibiotics obviously play a major role in changing the outcome. So the clock is ticking, you know, at least in the first 12 hours when the patient presents with septic shock. For every five minute delay, a mortality increases by 1%. So timely identification of sepsis, timely institution of appropriate antibiotic therapy is paramount in probably salvaging the condition. So diagnosis is not everything. Actually, it is, it is the only thing when it comes to sepsis. The benefits of early accurate diagnosis, obviously we have decreased morbidity and mortality. We have a decreased length of stay, decreased antibiotic costs because right now antibiotics are pretty expensive. And obviously day-to-day -day running of the ICU, the major chunk of the bill is antibiotics. Decreased ancillary diagnostic testing. And obviously it plays a major role in antibiotic stewardship in the long run because it will reduce the amount of antibiotics which are being used over a long period of time and reduce in effect the resistance to antibiotics. So we know that early detection is paramount, but is it that easy? The answer is unfortunately no, because right now we are based on conventional detection of sepsis, which is based predominantly on two major strategies. First strategy is one, detection of bacterial pathogen. That is obviously the blood cultures or the culture-based tests. And the culture-based tests, we know that as per a, a very large meta-analysis, only around 15 to 20% or max to max 40% of the patient's blood culture will turn positive, even if it were taken prior to the installation of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And the turnaround time is two to three days. So that's a, a lot, of, lot of turnaround time. Right now we are going on to PCR-based testing for especially high-risk uh, groups and all. 
But even PCR-based test does not really differentiate between colonization, infection, and there's a lot of overlap between that. It doesn't differentiate between live and dead bacteria. It does not tell you the sensitivity patterns. So those problems are always existing. And the second part of the strategy depends on the detection of host response, whether we have fever, we have tachycardia, we have tachypnea. In fact, the QSOFA is based on basically uh, three factors, presence of hypotension, altered mental status, and respiratory rate more than 22. So the QSOFA, mind you, is not a sepsis detection tool. It is just a tool for mortality. So it has been misconstructed as a sepsis detection tool. It is not so. And obviously the conventional lab tests, the WBC, the CRP and all, but we know there are, there are shortcomings in all of them. Obviously some patients will not mount a very strong response. Some patients may not mount fever at all. So these are all effectively have their own fallacies. And there is, to compound the problem, there's a huge amount of overlap between sepsis, septic shock, infection, inflammatory response syndrome caused by pancreatitis, burns, trauma, and other things. So it's a huge and considerable overlap. So we may be dealing with patients who may not be infectious, may not be in sepsis, but have signs of systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So the entire crux lies in to differentiate or identify accurately those patients who are having sepsis. So here is where the role of biomarkers come into the picture. Now, what exactly is a biomarker? We've been saying biomarker, biomarker, what exactly it is? It is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of either a normal biological process, a pathological process, or a pharmacological response to a therapeutic intervention. So this is the definition of a biomarker. When we talk about sepsis, now we know that sepsis is a syndrome. It leads to inflammation. It leads to coagulation, widespread activation of coagulation cascade, and it leads to tissue damage and repair. The idea is the sicker you are, the greater are these changes. So we can use biomarkers to identify these processes. We can use biomarkers to measure the quantity. We can stratify the severity based on biomarkers and we can prognosticate based on biomarker levels. <coughs> so effectively, if you want to classify sepsis biomarkers or biomarkers of any kind, it would be diagnostic, prognostic and therapeutic. Diagnostic is, in with regards to sepsis, is when we are able to differentiate between infectious and non-infectious cause. We are able to differentiate between viral or fungal versus bacterial cause, or we are able to identify the causative pathogen or organism. Prognosis, when there is for risk stratification, those patients who are actually going to benefit from antibiotic therapy, how long to give the antibiotics, when to de-escalate the antibiotics, and early additional diagnostics, when to do. So that is a prognostic biomarker. Therapeutic is obviously, which will enable you to accurately prescribe which antibiotic to be given. And this will obviously avoid excessive overuse and avoid the side effects of needless antibiotics. <coughs> so the silver bullet or the class characteristic of a classical or the best uh, ideal sepsis biomarker is still eluding us, right? The role obviously would be screening of patients at risk, establishing early diagnosis, risk stratification for those who are going to have a poor outcome and who will need more care, more attention, more therapy, monitoring response to intervention and how to predict outcomes of these patients. So the best biomarker will be that which is objectively measured, ideally a point of care kind of a measurement where you can do it on the bedside itself and you have rapid results, have a reference standard, rep reproducible by internal and external validation both, have well-known kinetics, as Dr. Dalim was saying, we should know the kinetics of the biomarkers, should be cost-effective because obviously it's a very expensive process and it should reflect the normal biological process or pathological process or response to therapy. With regards to what is the ideal biomarker, there we talk a lot about the AUROC or the area under the receiver operating characteristic. So this is how we, we judge whether this biomarker is actually good for whatever is being tested or not. So if you see the levels, <coughs> closer it is to one, the best it is for predicting what it's supposed to be used for. Anything less than 0.7 is either poor or fail. And we'll go through a few biomarkers and which are being used routinely and we'll see which one of them actually make the cut. So the questions which need to be answered is, does the biomarker help in diagnosis? Does it provide additional prognostic information? Is it better than the bedside clinical judgment? 
or is it better than the current scoring systems which are going around? So the list is long and distinguished. There's a list of biomarkers which are there because it's a syndrome. So there's a lot of different, different aspects of the syndrome, coagulation, endothelial damage, vasodilatation, cell surface markers, cytokines, so on and so forth. So you may have a lot of them. But the ones in red are the ones which I'm going to talk about effectively because these are the ones which have some practical utility. The question of whether to use single versus multiple biomarkers is still on. Single biomarkers obviously are simple, rapid, cheap, sensitive, not very specific, unfortunately. And they are usually associated with clinical science. If you combine them with clinical science, their, uh, their interpretation becomes better. So any biomarker should not be interpreted in separate, in, in isolation. It should always be in combination with the clinical sign. If you use multiple biomarkers, it is less rapid because multiple factors. It is more expensive, but it has increased specificity. So obviously there is still a toss up between single versus multiple. As you can see, the diagnosis of sepsis capacity becomes much more when you have multiple biomarkers into the picture rather than a single one. And lately it has been understood that it's very unlikely that a single biomarker will lead the, per, will lead the perfect diagnosis of, uh, at least in the context of sepsis. Because as I said, there's a continuity between SARS, sepsis, infection, <clears throat> septic shock and so on. It's a heterogeneous syndrome and the <coughs> sorry, consequences of sepsis with <coughs> the clinical definition keeps changing with time, night times dysregulated host response and the bacterial triggers of pathogens are numerous. So each one leads to different uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns and damage associated molecular patterns. And there's a huge different list of uh, uh, cascade which goes in different, different subset of patients. So this is a very interesting um, survey done in 2019 across Latin America, basically uh, 10 countries in South America, not Latin America, so South America. So they decided, wanted to see which biomarkers are being used. So what they found that majority people are using a combination of multiple biomarkers, preferentially lactate and procalcitonin and CRP, obviously. And <laughs> no biomarkers is around only 2%. So majority of the people are actually using biomarkers nowadays. Coming to the sepsis cascade, obviously we have an infection, which obviously leads, sets the ball rolling. That leads to widespread systemic uh, release of damage associated molecular patterns and pat uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns that leads to release of multiple cytokines, chemokines, uh, and upregulation up of certain genes. And that leads to this entire picture. So we can have certain biomarkers at specific stages. We can have lactic acid as a surrogate. We can have procalcitonin, which is the most popular biomarker and probably the, the one which is best used. IL-8, IL-6, IL-27. We can have N NCD64. We can have presepsin. We can have cell-free DNA. And we can have what's called septicide, which is basically molecular pattern nectarization. So in the various part of the sepsis cascade, we can target different, different parts of the cascade. So let's start with lactate. <coughs> so what about lactate? It's a part of your surviving sepsis guidelines. Uh, as a diagnostic value, it has got poor sensitivity and specificity, right? And, it, and the guidelines says it should be measured and repeated until, until the value comes down to less than two millimole per liter after your resuscitation. And if it does not come down to less than that, it's supposed to be a poor marker of prognosis. So effectively, it is universally accepted as a marker for worse outcomes. It's a prognostic marker rather than a diagnostic marker. Oh, so just that. having a lactate of high lactate does not mean the patient has sepsis. There are hundreds of reasons for high lactates, but as a prognostic marker, it is definitely has some room. Coming to the star of the entire uh, biomarkers in sepsis, uh, can I request the person to please mute the mic? I can't really speak like this. So, uh, procalcitonin is the is the is the pro hormone of calcitonin. It's normally produced by the C cells of the thyroid. Normal levels are usually undetectable to less than zero point zero five nanogram per milliliter. Now, this is classically whenever there's a bacterial infection, there is it stimulates procalcitonin production. So endotoxins and cytokines cause procalcitonin to be produced in many other tissues besides the C cells of thyroid. So there is extra thyroid production of procalcitonin. 
and concentrations more than 0.25 nanogram per ml can indicate significant uh, relevant bacterial infection and levels greater than two can indicate high risk of severe sepsis and septic shock. It is only slightly elevated in severe parasitic and fungal infections. Its levels are low in viral diseases. So if you want to say that, yeah, whether this disease is viral or bacterial, especially when it comes to chest infections, a lot of them are viral. So low level of procalcitonin, signs of pneumonia, well, we'll consider more of uh, viral pneumonias rather than bacterial pneumonias. One must, one must be sure that they are false positives, at least in the first two days of life, procalcitonin levels are high, heat stroke, multiple trauma, some surgical patients, patients with medullary thyroid cancer, these patients may have falsely high levels of procalcitonin. <coughs> so as a diagnostic tool, how well does it do? Yes, it is good as a diagnostic tool. A cutoff range of 1.1 nanogram per milliliter has been suggested with a sensitivity of 97% and a specificity of 78% to differentiate between SIRS and sepsis. So that is the basic step which we need to do, differentiate between SIRS and sepsis. So it does that. When we compare procalcitonin to other markers like CRP or lactate, definitely as I show you the receiver operating characteristic in the area under the URC, it definitely scores much better than CRP or lactate. And if you were to compare procalcitonin with other biomarkers, namely your um, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, TNF-alpha, and CRP, procalcitonin is probably the most ideally placed. First and foremost, because of levels start to rise after two hours, right? That much time it takes for you to sort of judge that the patient has sepsis. Then <coughs> the level starts to rise. It rises rapidly with response to bacterial infection. The levels raise, remain raised for almost 24 to 48 hours and the levels will fall also rapidly based on resolution. So effectively it's a real time, ideal real time marker. So it, it rises fast. It has a fast offset as well with response to appropriate therapy. In case the offset is not fast, then means the therapy is probably inappropriate and probably there's a very high risk of therapy failure. CRP on the other hand rises after six hours. It remains elevated for more than 48 to 72 hours. So probably not a very, very specific marker for sepsis. So coming to the diagnostic value, it may add diagnostic value to clinical assessment, but most of the data does not support starting antibiotic based on procalcitonin. We do it a lot, but ideally it should not be done because the data does not really support it. In fact, a very interesting point is that the cutoff levels will depend upon where exactly is it's a systemic sepsis, it's a systemic syndrome, or is it just because of a low, a low respiratory tract infection, which is more localized? When it's a more localized kind of a thing, <coughs> the procalcitonin levels are lower. When it's a systemic thing like sepsis, the procalcitonin levels are much more higher. Coming to the monitoring value, this is where procalcitonin has a very good role. It reduces the antibiotic duration and possibly even the mortality. So this is supported by the surviving sepsis guidelines. It can be used to shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy. Right. So this is the ProRata trial came out in Lancet 2021, which showed that when we have a comparison of using procalcitonin guided versus control, in different forms of infection, we can actually shorten the antibiotic exposure to the patient. The mortality even after reducing the antibiotic based on procalcitonin is not different. And as you can see the p-values, the clinical cure, the incidence of nosocomial infection, the relapse were non-significant. So effectively they, between control and procalcitonin induced reduction in antibiotic duration, it really didn't make much of a difference. <coughs> So patients who are diagnosed with severe sepsis, septic shock, if the delta PCT or the change in procalcitonin over the first four days is more than 80% and the level comes to below uh, 0.25 nanogram per ml, then we are on the right track and the therapy is probably successful. If it is less than equal to 80%, it says that there's a higher risk of mortality. So this is a prognostic tool as well. So when we see the procalcitonin uh, pro, uh, kinetic, those who are non-responsive, to antibiotic therapy will have persistent high procalcitonin levels, unlike those who have a response, appropriate response to procalcitonin. And this is the SAPS study, which says stop antibiotic based on procalcitonin guided study and less almost 20% reduction in antibiotic use and 1.5 days discontinuation of antibiotics. The same sentiment has been echoed by our Indian guidelines. <coughs> 
for antibiotic use in Indian ICUs can be used for de-escalation and we can actually reduce the, the duration of antibiotic therapy based on procalcitonin values and kinetics. Coming to the prognostic value, higher procalcitonin values, higher end organ damage, higher mortality. And this is an article which came out in AJRCCM, which showed that there is a difference between survivors and non-survivors in those patients who had higher procalcitonin at admission and over a period of time continue to have high as compared to those whose levels started to fall with antibiotic therapy. So it can have a role in evaluation, monitoring, and to discontinue. So probably the most ideal biomarker we have in our armamentarium nowadays. Coming to other, other uh, biomarkers, IL-6, I'll discuss just because in the reason uh, COVID, we have access to IL-6 now. It is not specific for sepsis. So it is not diagnostic. It can be a prognostic tool, basically because it's it has a, it's an early predictor of downstream effects like organ dysfunction. So it's a, it's a, it's a marker of inflammation. High, higher the markers, higher the level, more the inflammation, more the organ damage. Interleukin-6, uh, sorry, interleukin-8, best validated in pediatric patients, where uh, it, it, um, high level is associated with a 10-fold higher risk of mortality. Pentaxin-3, more of a prognostic marker. And there's a comparison of a lot of markers. You can see most of the AUC is favorable, at least for the latest markers, which is around 0 0.84, 0 0.91, 0 0.87, but predominantly for diagnostics. Pancreatic stone protein. Now, this is something which is taking a lot of interest of a lot of people. It's early sensitive, sensitive specific markers. It's available as a point of care device also. And the uh, area under the receiver operator characteristics is very good. It's almost 0 0.9. So this is something which is coming up nowadays and it's actually coming into the market because the turnaround time is only five minutes as compared to Procalcitonin, which takes almost 60 minutes. So this is the Albionic study, which is going on, which went on last year in uh, February, 2020. And it says that uh, it identifies, ident uh, it's a very good diagnostic marker for patients who develop sepsis <coughs> and maybe a game changer in the future, but not yet in the open market as yet. Septicide, now this is something uh, more based on molecular diagnostics where we are actually judging host response to interpretation where uh, it has been FDA approved uh, in 2017. So the uh, AUROC is around 0.82 to 0.88 and it base, is based on the host response interpretation. So the gene expression, this is the future where the gene expression of the host with response to sepsis is what is being judged. So now, this is what, in a nutshell, is what we are being used at these days for screening and diagnosis, CRPPCT, for evaluation, CRPPCT, for prognosis, IL-6, IL-8, CRP, NGAL, and other, uh, organ, uh, other markers of end organ damage. Conclusion, rapid diagnosis is vital. Obviously, right time, right antibiotic, decreased morbidity, mortality, increasingly being used because it helps in better diagnosis, early risk stratification. A lot of markers have been uh, studied, but so far only procalcitonin is probably the only marker which has shown to have some clinical relevance, at least in the day-to-day -day practice, at least with regards to diagnosis, monitoring, and prognosis. So if you ask me if the final proof of added value to clinical judgment, whether biomarker is actually the, the silver bullet biomarker is available, no, not as yet. It is still awaiting further research. And I'm sure in the future, a combination of uh, clinical plus biomarkers and more related to the molecular or at the level of genetic gene expression is what is going to come. It's going to be a point of care device which is going to tell you the diagnosis, I mean, the uh, confirmed sepsis within five to 10 minutes of its onset. So still work in progress and obviously a lot needs to be done. As of now, procalcitonin with its good and bad is what needs to be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shrikant Srinivasan for a wonderful uh, uh, session on uh, role of various biomarkers for various reasons for outcome, antibiotic, prognostication, and so on and so forth, and critically in patient. Thank you. And we'll take up the question uh, at the end. Uh, thank you, especially to Shrikant. He was uh, he is still having COVID and still uh, he accepted the request and to be there because uh, he is one of the uh, great stalwart in critical care. Moving to the next session, uh, uh, another special subset of population, the cancer patients. And the perioperative outcome is again quite challenging. And the role of biomarkers in cancer patients uh, do have an important role. So let's move to Dr. Josna Josuka Goswami, who is a very well uh, apt speaker.
for this particular session of uh, role of biomarkers for perioperative outcome in oncosurgical patient. Madam Goswami is a senior consultant and head of the department at uh, Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain at Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. She has a vast experience. Uh, she also was uh, earlier at the Stroke Hospital and she has a vast experience in liver transplant, uh, done a lot of transplant and she has a special interest into it being uh, specially trained from King's College London and University of Minnesota, USA. She has numerous publications in national and international journals and authors of uh, uh, many book chapters. She is past president of ISA Metro City, Calcutta, and she is also contributing a lot in society of oncoanesthesia and perioperative care. Over to you, ma'am, Dr. Josna Goswami. Thank you, Rakesh, for a nice introduction. And uh, thank um, Indian College of Anesthesiologist for inviting me for this talk today. And good evening and ha happy Republic Day to all of you. So my topic today is uh, uh, biomarkers for perioperative outcome in oncosurgical patient. So we'll uh, discuss next few minutes, uh, what are the biomarkers? How are they relevant in cancer surgery? How are they produced? What are the different types of biomarkers? What does the evidence say? And what is the implications on anesthesia practice? So as Dr. Srikant says in the last uh, talk, the, where you see what is the biomarkers, they are the characteristics of body which can be measured. So it can be a clinical signs like blood pressure, uh, oxygen saturation, heart rate, et cetera. Or it can be investigations like X-ray report or some investigation report. But in cancer, we'll see why it is important because we all know the cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide now. And it is reported, 10 million deaths is reported in 2020. And the economic impact is huge. So uh, also we see that solid organ malignancies constitute almost half of the cases. And the surgical resection is the definitive therapy. And the, it's seen that host inflammatory response in the perioperative period plays an important role for post-operative complication, cancer recurrence, and cancer uh, prognosis. So systemic inflammatory response is an important prognostic factor, which can be associated with lower post-operative survival. And the biomarkers are, for the, are the measurable indicators of this biological process, which can detect the degree of inflammation in each patient, coordinate with prognosis, and preoperatively recognize uh, changes, immune changes for better risk stratification. So it is various studies in animal model that shows that the skin injury, how it can release some bio, different cytokines, different inflammatory markers, and it can release from each level of the uh, tissue. Similarly, in uh, human studies, a lot of investors, uh, investigators has done the studies on human uh, object and they showed that even the surgical manipulation in human body is, can lead to release of pro-inflammatory as well as the anti-inflammatory cytokine. So what, what happens? The surgical injury, they uh, release the damage associated molecular pattern or damp, and that can cause glycocalyx damage. They can activate uh, the inflammatory cells and also they can activate and recruit the endothelial cells or chemokines. And these endothelial cells, they can cause the endothelial swelling, endothelial retraction and cause edema. And the leukocyte, are, they can uh, extravasate in the edema fluid and can release the reactive oxygen species. So all these cells, they can release the cytokines. And cytokines are, are varied in various types like interleukins, T1 necrosis factor, interferons, arways, colony stimulating factor, transform growth factors, beta, et cetera. So all these are involved in the modulation of host defense mechanism. So these all can be a marker and usually we see, but these cytokine markers are a little costly. So we are not being used uh, much in the uh, re regular research uh, oriented practice. Uh, the com most commonly used biomarkers, what we're using are NA NLR, that is neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, PLR, and platelet to lymphocyte ratio, MLR, that is monocyte lymphocyte ratio. So all these are ratios of components of the white cell count. 
Then this acute phase protein, like C-reactive protein and the albumin ratio, and to combine, combination of these acute phase proteins, that is Glasgow prognosis scale or modified Glasgow prognosis scale. So Glasgow prognosis scale usually uh, combines the, the CRP and albumin, and it also considered the hypoalbuminemia alone. But it's seen that hypoalbuminemia alone is, may not uh, be much effective. So modified uh, Glasgow prognosis score, it, can, it reduces the, uh, it, is, it uh, they doesn't contain the hypoalbuminemia in the score. So there are various studies now on, the, on different cancers. And this is in uh, this uh, recent study, and they examined the prognostic value of various marker in all operable cancer, and also a various specific surgical group. And the primary outcome was overall survival and cancer-specific survival. And they found that there is significant association of all the markers with both overall survival, uh, sur survival and also cancer-specific survival. And it is mainly GPS and M modified GPS and NLR in lung and GI cancer. So they uh, suggested that these, these markers should be a part of the routine preoperative workup and follow-up. Similarly, another study in uh, two, on 206 patients, they compared the prognostic value of NLR and GPS and MGPS, both preoperatively and follow-up settings. And they found that Preoperatively, MGPS and NLR both are uh, independently associated with the cancer-specific survival, but in post-operative follow-up study, only MGPS can have some effect. Similarly, another study, they included 177 patient of pancreatic cancer, and they found that NLR more than five is the superior marker than other markers. Another retrospective analysis, they included 534 patients for uh, perihilar cholangioma carcinoma uh, resection, and they also found that MGPS is a superior marker than other. This is a uh, study which uh, they done, uh, where they found that only NLR has got the potential to guide the treatment algorithm in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma patient. So this group, they have identified another novel factor that is GLR, which is a glucose to lymphocyte ratio. And they found that pre-treatment GLR can be used as an independent prognostic factor for survival of patient in case of inoperable pancreatic cancer. So they also suggested a nomogram, which can predict the overall survival rate, helps to plan uh, treatment strategies, facilitate individualized treatment, and choose the disease management approaches. So what happens during surgery and uh, surg any surgery or it causes a stress response that depresses the natural killer cell function and that causes increased uh, tumor growth and metastasis. Then interferon and interleukin and T helper one cells, they increase this natural killer cell function. And this IL-4, IL-10 and T helper cell 2, they increase the humoral immunity and but suppresses the TH1 cytokines. So these, and then prostaglandin E2 or PGE2, they are the cyclooxygenase pathway product. They suppress the interferon and uh, interleukin and TH1 cytokines. And on the other hand, they promote IL-4, IL-10, T helper 2, and cytokines. So these prostaglandin E2, IL-4, IL-10, these are the uh, pro-inflammatory uh, marker. Whereas the interferon and uh, IL-12, TH1, they are the uh, anti-inflammatory marker. So again, there may be another mechanism that's a neovascularization that uh, causes that caused by vascular epidermal growth factor, transforming growth factor, matrix metalloproteinase, et cetera. So these are the pro-inflammatory cytokines and there may be other causes of perioperative immunosuppression like hypothermia, transfusion, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis stimulation, which is caused by postoperative pain. And now there may be impact of anesthesia during the perioperative period, because anesthesia suppresses immune function, it alters the immune competent cells. It can have influence on adrenergic activity. So increased uh, epinephrine concentration can activate alpha-2 and beta-2 receptors on the macrophages, and they can trigger the 
uh, TNF alpha and IL6 bridges. So it influences the perioperative immune inflammatory response. So anesthetic drugs and anesthetic technique can reduce uh, or alter the stress response and cytokine activation postoperatively. So there are different anesthetic drugs like ketamine, thiopental, halothane. They suppress the NK cell activity and they increase the tumor metastasis. Whereas propofol can have some beneficial effect because it has got anti-inflammatory effect. It enhances the anti-tumor immunity, inhibition of COX-2. It uh, preserves the NK cell function. It reduces the PGE2, and it also has a weak beta adrenoreceptor binding. So it can be useful drugs. And also studies showed that propofol uh, ex exerts a protective effect through various mechanisms like anti-inflammatory. It reduces concentration of the cytokines, stimulates neutrophils to increase nitric oxide synthesis. I mean, to inhalational anesthetic agent, if it, though halothane is not that helpful, but sevoflurane can reduce the neutrophil apoptosis in animal model. Opioid is another important uh, drugs what we use in our regular day-to-day -day practice, but opioid can be harmful. It activates the mu opioid receptor cells on T cells, and that causes elevation, elevation of intracellular CMP, which activates CMP-dependent PKA, which prevents interaction of the leukocyte-specific protein tyrosine kinase, and that uh, with the T cell receptor complex induces the IL-2. And that causes T cell receptor signaling and ultimately angiogenesis and oncogenic signaling. So opioid is, uh, should be judiciously used, but it's also studies showed that on the other hand, animal studies, it is also, of course, animal study that shows that morphine given to relief cancer pain inhibits tumor growth and metastasis. So pre-surgical administration of morphine can optimize its beneficial effect on surgery induced metastasis. So they also suggested the co-administration of a new opioid peripheral antagonist can be helpful because it can uh, reverse the unwanted effect of the drug. Coming to regional anesthesia, it reduces the VEGF and TGF. It increases the ratio of TH1 or TH2 cells. So it can be beneficial in case of a cancer recurrence. But the recent studies, this meta-analysis, they showed that epidural anesthesia and analgesia can cause improved overall survival, but there is no effect on recurrence. So also this meta-analysis recently, they have also commented that RD, uh, regional anesthesia has no overall survival, recurrence free survival, or biochemical recurrence free survival benefit. But regional anesthesia can be helpful because it is associated, it is always given with the local anesthetics, which can be beneficial. It interrupts the nociceptive transmission at the injury site and reduces neurogenic inflammation. So local anesthetic agent, they can possess the interesting anti-inflammatory properties, and they have a multiple uh, the mechanism which can uh, by which it can attenuate the excessive inflammatory response without impairing the physiological host defense. So it is a very complex situation in the in, uh, in case of surgery perioperative period. You can see the cancer surgery can uh, can cause the proliferation and recurrence of metastasis by various mecha mechanism. There is a stress, uh, but this HPA stimulation, inhaled anesthetic agent can cause uh, uh, can when, uh, propagate this uh, pro proliferation and recurrence. Ketamine, thiopental, opioid pain. Uh, hypothermia, so all these things can be taken care of by regional anesthesia, local anesthetic agent, uh, naltrioxone, that is a um, uh, uh, morphine antagonist, beta blockers, COX inhibitors, etc. Then opioid uh, and catecholamines, this can cause angiogenesis and VEGF and can cause recurrence. So that part also can be inhibited by these drugs. And again, local anesthetics can inhibit the invasiveness of the cancer surgery. So this is perioperative period, it can is a complete disbalance of the uh, microenvironment, which can be taken care of and which can be, uh, all the drugs can be used judiciously to prevent uh, this uh, cancer metastasis and recurrence. So take home message is cancer treatment is evolving. And as we learn more about the molecular basis of cancer and new therapeutic targets, 
and surgery is the main treatment for potentially curable solid tumor. Surgical stress, anesthetic factor promotes local recurrence and distance spread of the cancer. So, but we should follow the current best practice in anesthesia and include all strategies that effectively decrease pain and attenuate stress. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for overview of uh, various uh, biomarkers in cancer patient, because in cancer patient, we are usually concerned with recurrence and uh, outcome related things. So I've nicely covered it. So ma'am, uh, we'll take up the questions after the next session, ma'am. So another subset of population is the neurosurgical procedures. Uh, we have to look their outcome, the management strategies and many other clinical parameters. And we'll be having a next session by uh, none other than uh, Dr. Shama Kamath uh, Shri Ganesh, who is uh, one of the uh, pioneer, who is one of the leader into uh, the neurosciences. He is uh, working as a professor at Nimans Bangalore. He has a special interest in perioperative neurosciences, including neuroscience, neuroanesthesia, neurocritical care and pain. And he has many publications uh, into the neuroanesthesiology and uh, neurocritical uh, care. He is a wonderful researcher. He has uh, done many good research, landmark research projects and meta-analysis, and especially trained for uh, uh, the research uh, from uh, the biggest uh, institute. And he's one of the uh, very well-versed the research researcher and uh, also a good clinician. Over to you, Dr. Sri Ganesh, for next session on the biomarkers for perioperative outcome in neurosurgery. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, and uh, uh, if you can share the presentation, is that okay sure. with you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Uh, most of the part uh, is already covered by the previous three speakers. So sure. I'll, uh, we can just go through that. Right, perfect. And you can take a discussion later. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think there is some issue with the audio, uh, Dr. Rakesh. We can hear you. We can hear you, Dr. Sri Ganesh. Okay, okay, right, right. I'm here. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, I think uh, even I am not able to hear. Uh, can I do the presentation from my end? Okay, sir. Okay, that will be fine, sir. Yeah, the only issue is if the power disruption occurs, then it might be a challenge. Please bear with me. Thank I will do, I will share from my end. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is this visible now? Yeah, visible. Okay. So uh, at the outset, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Rakesh uh, for inviting me to speak on biomarkers for perioperative outcome in neurosurgical patients and ICA for this uh, platform as well. 
So this is the learning objectives of this um, presentation. I'll quickly run you through the definition, advantages, and limitations of using biomarkers in the perioperative settings in neurosurgical patients, and uh, take you through some of the commonly studied systemic and brain-specific biomarkers. A couple, uh, one slide on uh, the sampling and assessment technique, and uh, predominantly um, focus on uh, the utility of uh, biomarkers in neurosurgical patients. And lastly, conclude with some of our own research that uh, we are currently undertaking and we plan to undertake in the near future. So the National Institute of Health Biomarkers Definition Working Group um, uh, defines a biomarker as a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or a pharmacological response to the therapeutic intervention. Likewise, the World Health Organization defines um, biomarker as any substance, structure, or process uh, that can be measured in the body or its product, and that includes non blood biomarkers as well, and influence or um, predict the incidence of outcome or disease. So what are the advantages and limitations of using biomarker in the perioperative setting? The advantages are uh, um, biomarkers are simple. Uh, they can be repeatedly uh, evaluated and provides objective measure of the physiological changes that are occurring in the body. They also uh, provide information about the underlying pathogenic process, and we can evaluate the response uh, to therapeutic intervention uh, in particular disease processes. But most importantly, in the perioperative settings, they can help us in stratifying the risk in the preoperative period and can guide in the perioperative management of patients. But remember that there are several limitations of using biomarker alone, either for diagnostic or for prognostic uh, purposes. Uh, most of the biomarkers are non-organ, non-disease specific. Um, many of them have a low sensitivity and specificity, and uh, a clear-cut threshold uh, is not generally described uh, consistently across various studies. So the common systemic biomarkers that are studied in neurosurgical populations are listed here. Um, the lactate, uh, uh, as we all know, is formed from pyruvate by glycolysis. And when the oxygen is scarce, the anaerobic metabolism sets in. And uh, generally, a threshold of 2 millimoles per liter is uh, considered as appropriate uh, to identify um, the pathological processes that are occurring and uh, consider this as a marker. Uh, and therefore, uh, because it is easily available and cheap, uh, it is commonly used biomarker in the perioperative setting. The next commonly used uh, uh, marker is the C-reactive protein. It is an acute phase protein produced by hepatocytes. Uh, the doubling of the levels is considered significant. And uh, again, it is non-specific. It is a marker of inflammation and infection. Um, the next group is the cytokines. These are small non-structural proteins and classified as either inter-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory, as already mentioned, uh, interleukin 10 and 4, and pro-inflammatory are interferon gamma, interleukin 6, 17, 1 beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. The last uh, set of markers are the oxidative stress markers, uh, melanodialdehyde, superoxide desmutase, and catalase. They are less uh, commonly studied, but are available uh, for research purpose. Coming to the neuronal specific biomarkers, uh, these are the four ones, the neuron-specific enolase, NSE, ascended beta, uh, the glial fibrillary acid protein, and ubiquitin carboxytermine hydrogenase. Uh, these are uh, elaborated uh, in, by the first speaker in detail, especially with regards to TBI. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly take you through the um, couple of points on each of those. Uh, NSE uh, is a glycolytic enzyme detected in neuronal cytoplasm, released in the extracellular space with cell death. A cutoff uh, that is commonly agreed upon is 80 nanogram per ml uh, uh, with a specificity of 83% and sensitivity of 61% is considered as a biomarker of brain injury. The S100B uh, is specific for CNS, expressed mostly in the glial cells. Um, they are uh, found commonly in the physiological state as well, uh, but uh, they are neurotoxic at higher levels. A cutoff of around 1.07 microgram per liter uh, predicts brain damage. The glial fibrillary acid protein is a cytoskeletal monomeric filament protein detectable in astroglia. They are detected in the blood on astrocyte death. And a cutoff of 0.2 nanogram per ml predicts poor neurological outcome. The last of the neuronal biomarker is ubiquitin carboxy terminal hydrolase. It is a cytoplasmatic enzyme found in pericaria and dendrites of the neurons, expressed uh, with the alteration in the blood-brain barrier permeability. A cutoff of around 13.8 nanogram is a diagnostic of poor outcome. Now, um, why 
are biomarkers used in the perioperative setting. One, to predict mortality. Two, uh, uh, in the acute period, it can give some idea about nociception and surgical stress. Indication of post-operative infection, such as surgical site infection, VAP or sepsis in the post-operative period, cardiac dysfunction, acute post-operative kidney injury, and post-operative neurological deficit. The late outcomes uh, which can be predicted include uh, readmission rates, post-operative cognitive dysfunction, and tumor recurrence. Um, so what are the sources that can be utilized for assessment of uh, these biomarkers? Most commonly in neurosurgical patients, the blood and the CSF that is used and urine, saliva, and tissue uh, can also be studied. The co two common assessment techniques uh, are immunoassays, of which uh, ELISA, the, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, is the most commonly used for single biomarker assessment, and mass spectrometry, uh, which has uh, several other uh, ways of assessing uh, biomarkers and can you, uh, help in detecting multiple biomarkers in single group. Now, coming to the individual biomarkers and individual neurological pathologies, um, lactate, again, as I mentioned, is because it is cheap, commonly available, has been extensively studied. Uh, remember that rapidly growing tumor cells have high glycolytic rates and therefore can produce lactate even in the presence of oxygen. And this is known as Warburg effect. Now, studies have shown that serum lactate level correlates with the tumor grade and therefore lactate has been used as a marker of tumor progression, response to therapy and recurrence. Now, this particular study uh, published in Journal of Clinical Neuroscience by one of uh, neuroanesthesiologists, um, I didn't uh, use lactate to identify low grade from high grade tumors. Now, this has a prognostic value in helps in communicating with the family and the patient in the preoperative period itself. Similarly, uh, lactate has also shown to um, have a good um, differentiation ability uh, with regards to metastatic brain tumors vis a vis meningiomas and pituitary tumor, as you can see from this figure. And lastly, um, um, this particular study used lactate for predicting neurological outcomes. So you can see that the length of stay and the neurological deficit were significantly different when the lactate levels were elevated. And one of the reasons, some of the reasons for elevated lactate levels uh, in neurosurgical patients is uh, prolonged vein retraction, local hypoperfusion under the retractors, um, focal cerebral ischemia, cerebral anaerobic metabolism, and lastly, disruption of the blood-brain barrier which can release several of these biomarkers into the bloodstream. Now, can biomarker predict survival rates in glioblastoma multiforme, which is a severe form of uh, glioma or a brain tumor? Uh, this particular study um, uh, looked at various biomarkers uh, and found that lower pretreatment levels of uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, monocyte lymphocyte ratio, derived neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, and systemic index of inflammation, and higher levels of absolute eosinophil count and eosinophil lymphocyte ratio correlated with the long-term survival of more than 36 months. Um, again, as I mentioned, this helps in communicating with the patients in the absence of clear-cut clinical and radiological um, markers to predict long-term outcomes. Lastly, um, any neurosurgical um, uh, situation uh, can result in cerebral edema and occludin and claudin, uh, which form the tight junction proteins uh, in the blood-brain barrier, uh, the levels of these uh, increase in the blood uh, in response to the damage or the extent of the um, blood-brain barrier damage. So this particular study demonstrated that as the brain edema, so this brain edema can be measured on uh, imaging, as the uh, severity of the edema increase, the serum occludin levels also increase, suggesting um, the utility of uh, using occludin as a biomarker for predicting perioperative cerebral edema. Coming to the vascular surgery, basically aneurysm surgeries, which are commonly performed, uh, significant increase in interleukin-6, interleukin-10, C-reactive protein, and vascular uh, um, cell adhesion molecule uh, compared to the baseline um, predicted occurrence of post-operative weakness uh, following aneurysm clipping surgery. And uh, the, again, the timing of increase in biomarkers is not consistent. Uh, interleukin-6 increases significantly at around 24 to 48 hours, whereas the anti-inflammatory cytokine, that is interleukin-10, uh, increases very early between 3 to 6 hours of surgery. The second um, uh, utility of uh, biomarkers in neurosurgical population is to differentiate infection uh, from sterile inflammation. Now, post-operative fever is common in neurosurgical uh, patients, uh, which results in a diagnostic dilemma warranting unnecessary laboratory and imaging tests and uh, misuse of or abuse of antibiotics. Uh, 
um, one of the reason for this diagnostic dilemma is alteration in the CSF composition due to the primary brain pathology and also because of the handling of the brain from the surgical procedure. Now, this particular study demonstrated the increase in interleukin-6 and oncocytin M uh, to be indicative of uh, uh, sterile inflammation, whereas increase in interleukin-17, interleukin-12, P40 by P70, and interleukin-23 level suggest you of nosocomial bacterial infection. Now, um, surgical site infection can also be predicted by um, elevation of uh, certain biomarkers, and most common studied are interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, and in spine surgery, increase in interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein was uh, associated with high sensitivity and specificity. Similarly, for cranial surgeries, a secondary increase in C-reactive protein beyond post-operative day 5. Uh, please note that C-reactive protein can increase in the early post-operative period because of uh, the nociception and tissue injury. But in secondary increase beyond day 5 uh, usually suggests a secondary um, infection or surgical site infection. Uh, there are other systemic complications which can uh, uh, make the outcome of neurosurgical patients uh, poorer, and one of them is acute kidney injury. Now, um, the clinical markers such as serum creatinine are, uh, or laboratory markers which are commonly used as serum creatinine, but there are uh, certain other markers which elevate very early, and utilizing them in the immediate post-operative period can help in early detection of uh, potential uh, patients who can develop acute kidney injury. So the serum cystatin, uh, urinary albumin creatinine ratio, and NSTL uh, beta D glucosamine ADs have been used, and uh, they have shown to predict tubular damage. But the most commonly used are high sensitivity C-reactive protein and urinary uh, neutrophil gelatinase associated lipokaline or NGAL. Now both of them uh, are commonly used clinically, and uh, they have shown to predict uh, acute kidney injury in neurosurgical patients. Now, biomarkers and traumatic brain injury, uh, uh, the first speaker has already uh, covered it in, in detail, so I'll skip this. So I'll take you through some of the research work that we are currently undertaking, and uh, these are the broad areas that we are utilizing biomarker as one of the um, uh, component of um, prognostication, and uh, we have used it in COVID-19 uh, to identify surgical stress, cerebral ischemia, perioperative cardiovascular complications, and for post-operative cognitive dysfunction. So um, all of us have gone through a turbulent phase in the last two years of COVID-19, uh, taking care of the patients. And uh, we are all familiar with the certain biomarkers which are used uh, in these patients. So in this particular study, um, uh, we identified uh, platelets, leukocyte counts, LDL, CRP, ferritin, D-dimer, and procalcitonin. And we found that uh, the levels uh, could differentiate survivors and non-survivors and those with good neurological outcome and poor neurological outcome. The next is the uh, utility in uh, intraoperative nociception and um, stress response to surgery. Uh, this was a study which we uh, published uh, in 2020, where we looked at commonly uh, available biomarkers such as serum cortisol, random glucose, arterial pH, pH and leukocyte count, and um, uh, the response to therapy. Uh, so here we compared opioid versus non-opioid as a primary uh, intravenous analgesic in the intraoperative period, and we found that there was no difference in uh, stress response. Uh, uh, nociception response uh, during surgery using surgical plate index and so also the biomarkers of stress response were no different between opioid and non-opioid technique um, uh, for um, analgesia in patients undergoing brain tumor surgery. Uh, currently, uh, one of our resident is um, doing a thesis on um, uh, erectospinal pain block for spine surgery patients and one of the secondary outcome is to assess uh, response to surgical stress using cortisol, blood glucose and leukocyte count. The other area where we uh, utilize biomarkers was in detection of uh, vasos, cerebral vasospasm, cerebral ischemia, and functional outcomes. We used uh, two uh, markers, that is uh, S100 beta and uh, neuron-specific enolase. Uh, however, uh, uh, in our study where we looked at the effect of uh, remote ischemic preconditioning on um, the cerebral vasospasm and ischemia, we did not find uh, them to be useful. Uh, that is why it is important to select the appropriate biomarkers when we are doing any uh, study. Uh, currently, we are exploring uh, three other markers uh, which have been shown uh, to be useful in cerebral ischemia, not specific to cerebral vasospasm or uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, but uh, in general uh, for uh, ischemia, and these include nitric oxide, uh, GF, uh, AP, and UCHL. Uh, we hope that uh, these will provide some indicator of uh, 
uh, cerebral ischemia and effect of remote ischemic preconditioning on uh, ischemia. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, the biomarker need not necessarily be uh, of uh, derived from the blood. Uh, it can be other physiological markers such as um, pulse rate or the blood pressure uh, or any other such things, uh, physiological parameter. In this particular study, we are using uh, cardiac autonomic dysfunction as a marker to predict post-induction hypotension, intraoperative hypotension, and major adverse cardiac event. And uh, maybe we will get some insight into the utility of biomarker in this scenario as well. The other broad um, uh, problems that uh, we see as anesthesiologists is the uh, spectrum of uh, cognitive dysfunction, and these include emergence delirium, postoperative delirium, and postoperative cognitive dysfunction. Uh, we recently identified certain clinical and anesthetic factors that contribute to emergence delirium and postoperative delirium. Um, and currently, we are undertaking um, a research project where we are looking at long term cognitive dysfunction at three months and six months after neurosurgery. Um, but again, this is not uh, biomarker related. In, but in this proposed uh, uh, RCT, uh, we are looking at the effect of dexmelatomidine on postoperative delirium and cognitive dysfunction. And uh, as a secondary outcome, we are also looking at biomarkers of uh, um, surgical stress, such as cortisol, glucose, and leukocyte count, and whether they can help us in um, predicting uh, difference in the therapeutic interventions and occurrence of cognitive dysfunction. Now, this is again a recently sanctioned project. Uh, it's, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a single biomarker, and as previous speakers have also mentioned, a single biomarker may not be very um, uh, useful in uh, either diagnostic or, uh, or uh, prognostication. And therefore, we need to combine it with uh, several other biomarkers or with clinical and with clinical uh, parameters. So, in this particular study. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So in this particular study, um, uh, in traumatic brain injury patients, we are uh, evaluating uh, clinical um, scorings and neuropsychological assessment combined with the um, blood cytokine levels, uh, S100B, GFAP, and brain-derived neurotropic factor. And then we are also looking at uh, radiomics or um, MR spectroscopy derived uh, uh, glutamergic and GABAergic uh, neurotransmitters. And uh, we hope that uh, with these, uh, we can uh, communicate better with the family because most of these patients with traumatic brain injury are young and a patient with GCS of 15 uh, may not have a good long-term outcome, whereas a patient with GCS of 8 or 9 uh, can go on to have a good outcome. So current uh, clinical and radiological assessments are not sufficient to predict long-term outcomes in uh, these young uh, victims of traumatic brain injury. And therefore, whether these biomarkers and other uh, combined approach of uh, looking at uh, outcomes uh, will help us in better uh, um, uh, assessment of these patients and prognostication will be studied through this project. Uh, in the post-operative period, most of the neurosurgical patients are in a state of disorders of consciousness and uh, the sleep is significantly disturbed in these. Sometimes the assessment of sleep is also a challenge. And to better understand this, we are undertaking this particular project uh, where we are looking at electroencephalography and polysomnography along with serum melatonin and cortisol as a marker um, for uh, sleep quality and sleep architecture and correlate with the uh, um, overall uh, long-term outcome in patients with uh, uh, neurosurgical, neurosurgical and neurological pathologies. And lastly, as we all know, pain is a subjective phenomenon. However, unfortunately, in uh, neurosurgical patients and neurological patients with brain injury, uh, pain assessment is a challenge. And uh, again, a combination of clinical, neurophysiological, and uh, immunobiological assessment of nociception and pain uh, becomes important uh, in these patients. And through this project, uh, we are looking at uh, markers of uh, stress in the acute period. Uh, we are using <clears throat> interleukin-33 ST2 complex, epinephrine, norepinephrine, to various noxious stimuli. And also the overall uh, acute uh, pain in these patients following um, acute brain injury. And hopefully uh, with this again, uh, multi-pronged approach, we might have some um, ability to predict uh, how um, the pain uh, perception is in these particular patients and whether this affects long-term outcomes in neurosurgical and neurological patients. So uh, to conclude, biomarkers have potential to be a good surrogate markers um, of uh, clinical outcomes. The broader definition of biomarker should include non-blood parameters, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, remember that uh, the biomarkers are indicator of normal biological phenomenon, pathological processes, and also can help us in predicting uh, the response to therapeutic intervention. However, because of the multiple etiopathologies, pathways, mechanisms of uh, any brain injury, uh, 
uh, such as traumatic brain injury, a single biomarker may not be very useful in this population. And therefore, combining multiple biomarkers and biomarkers with imaging and clinical markers are likely to enhance the success of outcome prediction in neurosurgical patients. Thank you very much uh, for your patient hearing, and I'm open to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shriganesh, for a wonderful session. Uh, so the session is open to house. May we welcome uh, one of our very senior faculty member, Dr. Uh, Manorma Mittal, madam, is here. Madam, your comments. Welcome, ma'am. Madam, you are muted, ma'am. Can you just please unmute yourself, ma'am? All the speakers gave excellent lectures and they were very lucid and informative. There was some repetition, but uh, that was expected, some overlap from one to the other speaker. And I'm sure there will be many uh, questions. Now, I'm here to listen to those questions and answers. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think overlap was primarily, uh, though they were a different subset of population, cancer, neurosurgery, uh, trauma, and critical care. But yes, some of the biomarkers uh, are a little commoner uh, in each, but yes, their interpretation is a little different, which uh, all the eminent uh, speakers have mentioned. So before uh, uh, the other participants have a question, I have one question which uh, any of the uh, faculty can answer it. Uh, what should be the timing? Of, for example, when we are talking about the clinical management, which is the correct time when we should start thinking of for getting these biomarkers? Because say a patient comes to in a perioperative period, in a post-operative period, and we are looking for some clinical management change. So I'm putting it a very generic question as a difficult one, but when should we start thinking of uh, that? Yes, we should send some biomarker rather than just thinking of uh, clinical parameters or monitoring aspect uh, or routine investigations or imaging. Uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh, Dr. Sri Kant. Uh, you want me to answer that first? Yeah, Dr. Sri Ganesh, please. Okay. Um... See, uh, we are all learning uh, in the learning phase of using biomarkers in anesthesia practice. Though to some extent, uh, biomarkers have been used in uh, critical care, uh, but in anesthesia practice per se, uh, the utility of um, biomarkers uh, is not so high. And as I mentioned, we are in the learning stage, so we are not very uh, confident to say what is the ideal time, when it should be done, and what should be the um, uh, outcomes that it can help us predict. But as I mentioned, some of the markers are uh, possible to be done in the preoperative phase itself or in the intraoperative phase. There are several studies which have shown intraoperative lactate, a simple test which is possible to be done in the blood gas analysis itself, can predict outcomes. We know that most often it is hypotension, hypoxia, but most often hypotension, that is the clinical and uh, physiological marker that is available in the intraoperative period. Um, that itself is sufficient to predict this patient is likely to do uh, not so well. But in addition, if you have some biomarkers, say lactate or any other markers which can um, predict uh, uh, outcomes, that gives more confidence when we communicate with the patient. And most of the patients, what do they want to know? What will be the outcome in this patient? Will he require ICU care? How long will he stay in the ICU? Will it result in death? Or will it result in some, especially neurosurgical patients, will it result in long-term deficits, either in motor deficits, speech deficits, vision deficit, whatever. These are important for the patient. We should look at patient important outcomes and whether these markers, what we are assessing, can help us in predicting that. But I am not very uh, sure at this moment to tell at what time point uh, these markers are definitely going to predict. Uh, as I said, it has to be a combination of markers in the preoperative phase, intraoperative phase, and even early postoperative phase. Uh, maybe serum creatinine level may rise later on and can patient may require dialysis at a future stage. 
Not all may require, even if serum creatinine level increases. But if there are some specific marker of tubular damage, um, these can help us in predicting or drug induced aminoglycosides commonly used in ICU. So many antibodies can cause renal dysfunction. Uh, their use can be limited uh, or reduced uh, or uh, uh, in with the use of these biomarkers. But uh, in short to your question, timing uh, my from my perspective, uh, it's not very clear. But Maybe I think you, you already answered it. Basically, it's a clinical judgment that what are you looking for? What clinical outcome you are looking for? Are they looking for the tubular injury? Whether you're looking for the uh, early incipient sepsis or I mean, whatever the clinical parameters or clinical assessment you are doing. It. So the timing and the type of markers would, would be uh, based on it. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh with us. Dr. Vibhanayak. So I think the, the uh, sessions are very clear. So not many questions, but uh, the markers and uh, as uh, Manavra Mitra Madam also said, there was uh, uh, no repetition, but repetition has enforced the importance of those biomarkers uh, in our perioperative setting including in critical care setting. Uh, so I think it, it, it was a absolutely a useful session. So I will sincerely thanks to all the eminent faculty members for taking out their time and uh, taking the sessions in which it was a different type of uh, session today, which was very focused, but I am sure that uh, the emerging role of biomarkers in uh, clinical practice for different purpose, for clinical management, for initiating or withdrawing any intervention for prognostication, for assessment purpose. So they have a different roles and uh, uh, many roles are already proven. Like for example, the role of lactate, the role of procalcitonin, they're very well proven and they're in the guidelines. Some of the roles are emerging, but yes, in near future, with more of uh, molecular sciences research, which are upcoming, probably we'd have more markers, which have a high specificity and sensitivity so that we can predict certain things exactly when to start antibiotic, when to stop antibiotic, when to make an intervention, when to stop an intervention. So probably I think, uh, and uh, having said that biomarkers do have their own limitation. So we cannot uh, rule out or no, totally uh, take away the clinical judgment, the clinical assessment or the, I think it's a combination of your clinical assessment, your clinical examination, your imaging, the way the patient is behaving and then in addition to the uh, various biomarkers, probably will be benefiting our patient for a good outcome. See, uh, any uh, comments from uh, Jessie Sood, madam? Uh, she's there. She, she has a vast experience uh, in uh, uh, various clinical aspect, ma'am. So comments from your side. Good ma evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, again, once again, a very important, uh, a very interesting webinar that we've held today. And I'm really happy that we thought of this webinar. And as Rakesh, uh, we've chosen the topics, not only it is basically the perioperative out practice, the biomarkers used. And as uh, Dr. Sri Ganesh uh, said, Sri Ganesh said that uh, it is, uh, of course, a question mark, but gradually we will uh, learn and probably pre, intra and post-op will give you a trend of how, how the progress of the patient will be. So this lecture has been excellent. Uh, this whole webinar has been excellent. And I would really like to thank Dr. Dalim Badia, Dr. Srinivasan, Dr. Jyotsna, and Dr. Sri Nagesh for their excellent lectures. And uh, this was a new topic and it has really benefited all of us. In fact, it was a learning webinar for many of us. And there were such, so many new things that we came to know. Thanks a lot once again. And thank you, Rakesh, for so excellently conducting the webinar. Thank you very much. And hoping to see you next week again. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And thank you all the speakers. And thank you, uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan, for always uh, increasing and uh, taking the IEC academics to a higher level. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. I met Dr. Sri Ganesh after a long time.
Thank yes, you, madam. Yes. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, Jyotsna. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.